Chapter 20 Canton Lijanx Curos 26 Days Until Sound In the pre-dawn, we march to the Canton Lijanx Curos campsite, favoured by the Plains Druids. The sanctuary is a series of five concentric circles, alternating in makeup of wood and stone. Whatever their meaning was meant to be, it was lost centuries ago, when the elder races left. From the riverside, a big grassy causeway leads up the hill to Canton. The rosy false dawn illuminates on the encircle, where the Gwery will take place. The sun peeks over the eastern hills. As one, Simbel's band pivots to the west and watches as the rays of light shine upon Silbury Hill. A fiery yellow brilliance races down the hill, replacing the warm pinkish hues. Welcome to Cantom, Simbel says to me. He turns to Yzella and Arthmael. Remove the irons. Wordlessly, Arthmael produces the key. It will be your duty to watch over Grammy, and when he is summoned, to ensure he makes it to the stone circles. Do you understand your charge? Simbel asks. Yes, Lord, Yzella and Arthmael say in unison. He beckons Arthmael over to him and places his arm around Arthmael's drooping shoulders. You have won the tournament this year, but it would be best for you to study the herbal remedies one more year before you leave us. I believe this with all my heart, and if I am unable to attract another druid skilled in these arts, I will see to it that you may go to whomever you wish to master your craft. Yes, Lord, Arthmael mumbles. Simbel pats him on his back. We are the first to arrive as usual, Simbel says to his charges. Let's prepare for the moot. Bracketing the grassy path every ten paces up to Canton Lejunx Curos are immovable standing stones. This had to be the work of the giants in the forgotten past. The first group to arrive, Yzella says. And that's always us. Set the bridges over the ditch to the central stone circles. Circles? You aren't even familiar with Canton Lejunx Curos? Arthmael asks, disgusted. There are two circles, each slightly larger than Memmerkov K, one to the north and one to the south. Around them is the largest circle in all the world, one hundred stones in all, which stand inside the inner earthen rampart, Yzella says, cutting off Arthmael. No druid, save the nine, may enter any of the rings unless summoned, Arthmael smirks at me. You'll be one of the rare ones called to stand in front of the nine. The impulse to blacken an eye on his overly smug face is strong. I stare down at the now pus-filled infections dotting each arm and calmly look away. I may be called to stand in front of the nine, but I refuse to act the part of a drunken brawler as they deliberate my fate. Yzella gives Arthmael a shot to the ribs and resumes her explanation. The nine debate in the southern ring. Once consensus is achieved on whatever topics they deem important, Simbel, as the speaker for the nine, approaches the northern ring alone. All the druids in the area flock outside the great circle, and he announces the rulings of the council. He must be hoarse after that. No, he speaks into the cove stones of Ogmius, and the god of the bard amplifies Simbel's voice so that all within the ramparts may hear the rulings as if in a private conversation. And we will find out what this precious secret of yours is, Arthmael says. Yzella rolls her beautiful green eyes. It won't be long before Simbel starts assigning duties. You two need to follow me, unless you want to be stuck digging the latrines. Arthmael points to the west. Is that Lord Caradoc and his flock of Merlins? It is, Yzella says. He will go directly to see Simbel, so we can still escape if we leave now. Let's go, Arthmael says. Wait, Caradoc is coming this way, I say. The first bird has a lazy upstroke. It dives straight at us, flaring its wings at the last moment. 
it becomes hazy to the eye for a moment. Caradoc's human form drops the last few inches to the ground. I can't help but smile at his theatrical landing. Greetings, druids, he says in his robust voice. He starts at Arthmael and continues his gaze until he comes to me. He cocks his head sideways. Grammy? Lord Caradoc, I bow. I did not expect to see you here. The last I heard from Boswin, neither he nor you would be attending this moot. He is not, as far as I know, Lord Caradoc. I arrived with Sinbel and his druids. I place my arms behind my back, once I'm sure Caradoc has seen the iron rash upon my arms. This is Yezela and Arthmael. As my jailers bow to Caradoc, he signals for me to be patient, or to stop talking, or something else entirely. I decide to let him direct the conversation. Curious. And what of your quest? It is still in progress, Lord. Caradoc narrows his eyes. Both Yezela and Arthmael are doing their best to be inconspicuous. I will find time to speak with you later today, he says carefully. This is Eosia, my second. He turns and invites his protégé to step forward and meet us. I wish to have a quick word with him before I am off to greet Simbel. If you don't mind, I would like to leave him in your company. Will that be acceptable? Yes, Lord, Arthmael blurts. Caradoc pulls Eosia off to the side, where Arthmael grins from ear to ear. The conversation is short-lived and one-sided. Eosia nods his understanding before he returns to us. May you all have a prosperous moot, Caradoc says. He starts to trot toward Canton Lejanx Kuros while flapping his arms. At last, he turns into a merlin and soars away. I keep telling him that's a ridiculous exit, Eosia says, but he's fixated on dramatic entrances and exits. You're the Eosia? Arthmael asks. My name is Eosia, yes, he says, bemused by Arthmael's excitement. You defeated Judoc last year. Arthmael is staring wide-eyed. Apparently, the Gwary champion rates higher than a druid lord to him. Judoc is the best staff fighter I have ever faced. Is he competing again this year? No, he has an injured arm and cannot compete, Arthmael says. Let's go over to Hedred's spot, Yzella says, before Arthmael can recount Eosia's entire match. There is something happening that I don't want to miss. Hedrits? Do any of his people ever leave the underground? Eosia asks. They do, under the cover of night. They are staying at the giant's barrow west of the river Kennet. And you all should know that my sister, Catel, is one of them. And I will remove teeth from your head if you say anything disparaging about her. Her aggressive stance dares one of us to test her. None of us are that foolish. The long barrow sits along a gentle slope, with only the rustling of the wild grass to keep it company. A stone twice as tall as a man and equally wide anchors the front façade. Even with the rising sun at our backs, the entrance eludes us for a time. It is only when I hear the soft rumble of drums that the hidden side entrance is revealed. Eosia is next to me at once. He keeps his back to Yzela and Arthmael and speaks to me in a low tone. Caradoc said to aid you in any way you see fit. We will speak later. He gestures to Yzela and Arthmael to hurry to us before confidently stepping in front of me and entering the barrow. The drums are joined by many male voices chanting in some version of the ancient tongue. A short, bold druid runs breathlessly out of the tomb. Come quickly and make no noise. Yes, Lord, Yzella whispers. She shepherds us into the darkened cave mouth. That is a druid, Lord. The large stones keep the entrance in shadow at sunrise, but we can see the rays of sunlight sinking along the face of the barrow. Belenos will peer within the cave in only a few heartbeats. 
stumbling in the dark, we pass between two druids chanting into empty side chambers of the hall. Their cadence echoes back from the chambers, yielding a deep, powerful harmony. The sound echoes within, and I can feel the vibrations through my bones. Deeper inside is another pair doing the same at the second pair of side rooms. We pass them, and the bald druid shoves us against the walls of the final chamber. The light of Belenos slowly penetrates deeper into the barrow. The baritone voices slowly drop off, and the drumming tempo slows. The alto timbre of a woman's choir fills the space. Their harmonies increase into a crescendo as the sunlight strikes the back of the central alcove. The darkness is replaced with blinding white light as the sunlight reflects off the white strike stone at the end of the barrow. We all must avert our eyes from the very presence of the gods. One final shriek of exultation and the women's voices fall silent. The men begin spinning flat wooden discs attached to strings. A deep, booming vibrato cascades through the chamber. It can be none other than the thunderous voice of the Earth Mother speaking to her son, Belenos. My legs go weak as the goddess's presence vibrates through my chest. My heart pounds ever faster to keep pace with the goddess. Only Hedred is unmoved by the spectacle. Following his eyes, I see symbols glowing from the walls around us. After a scant few moments, the light sinks off the strike stone to the dirt floor. Before I can gather my thoughts, the light from Belenos retreats from the barrow entirely. All are silent as we contemplate what we just experienced. Somehow, the male singers manage to shake off their amazement and start a steady cadence. The female druids join us in the corridor and Hedred leads us into the daylight. The spell broken. Hedred's cave druids shield their eyes from the sun and scurry for the shadows. The bald man drops to his knees and draws the symbols from the walls in the dirt. Thank you, Lord Hedred, for allowing us to partake in this ritual, Yizella says. She is absolutely radiant, standing in the sunlight. Her curly, blonde hair shines like fine strands of gold. Another woman, who could be Yizella's twin, save for her chalky white skin and dark hair, ventures from the shadows and hugs Yizella. Everyone, this is my sister, Yizella, the pale druid says. And this big, strong man... She grabs a tall, awkward druid by the hand and drags him over to her. Is Sifra. Yazella is with the plains druids, and this guy studies under Egan. Sifra is too busy studying the ground to acknowledge anyone. He's all knees and elbows. I don't know of another person who would call him strong. Hello, everyone, Yazella says. Hedred waits for a moment to see if there are any more distractions. Think on this blessing that the Earth Mother has bestowed upon you this day. Only the most prosperous of men receive such a boon. Yes, Lord, his druids respond. It may be a bit unseemly, but I must leave you now. The other lords are no doubt grousing about my absence. When I return, I will give whatever guidance I can about this visitation. For now, keep darkness from your thoughts. The absence of light is nothing to fear, his charges reply in unison. In broad daylight, he anamorphs into a bat, of all creatures, and flies off toward Canton de Junk's Kuros. Thanks to Eosia's suggestion, we head for the stone circle south of Canton. The rest of the druids are off to the east at the Gwery. My secret, he says, is that for several years I spent my time here practicing staff fighting instead of being an idle spectator. We approach the stone circle and Yosia winks at Yizella. I know Arthmael and Yizella are good with the staff. Why don't you show me your skills, Grammy? Why is everyone smiling so mischievously? 
in no time, sweat is pouring off me as I try to keep up with the Osea and his lightning-quick strikes. I'm no match for his skills on my best days. His staff hits the back of my knees. I crumple to the ground yet again. I think Grammy has had enough for now, Eosia says, without a trace of smugness. He pulls me up from the ground. Your footwork is much better, and you hold the staff up higher, like you should. You have learned a lot today. Easy for him to say, when it's me who keeps ending up lying helpless on the ground. Arthmyel, are you ready to spar? Yazella says. I'll go easy on you, he replies. Yazella unleashes a wicked spin and has her staff down low. She sweeps Arthmael's feet and he tumbles to the ground. Thank you for the courtesy, but I don't think I will need it. She skips off to the ring of standing stones, grinning from ear to ear, waiting for his next move. It doesn't take long before their cracking of staves can be heard across the valley. Yazella uses her quickness to dance away from Arthmael's fearsome barrage. Yazella, you have a lower centre of balance, so you can take more chances. Stop fighting so defensively and go on the attack, Eosia calls. Yazella nods her head and starts taking the fight to Arthmael. The cracking of staves is joined by audible grunts and heavy breathing. Catel and Sifra, uninterested in dueling, stand deep in the shadows of the forest. He has fine, blonde hair and delicate features on his tall, thin frame. It's hard to believe that Sifra is a druid, or even from Patani. Surely he comes from some softer stock of people. Neither he nor Katel carry any weapon save a sling. They make a very strange pair, but I wonder who else could possibly be a match for either one of them. While your escorts are busy, we need to talk, Eosia says. Very soon, Arthmael will start dipping his weapon, and Yazella will brain him. So tell me, what has happened since you left our lords? I wish I could, but I have been sworn to tell no one else of my quest, that is not already aware. I show him my arms. Lord Simbel took a dim view of my stance and slapped irons on me. He placed irons on a druid, Yosia says loudly. Arthmael turns toward us and Yazella connects right behind his ear. Arthmael is tasting dirt in the blink of an eye. Now you'll talk, Yazella says with menace in her voice. The treatment I received from the plains druids was not part of my quest, I shout back. Yazella twirls her staff and lodges it under her left shoulder. She advances in a no-nonsense fashion toward us. Say one bad word, I dare you, she says to me. Yazella, Eosia says. I don't know what has transpired, so I'm in no position to judge. But this man's arms are infected and they need to be treated. Yazella's eyes harden. Anything else you'd like to add? I raise my hands up in supplication. At last, she concedes to not dent my head. Arthmael has managed to rise to his hands and knees. He's shaking his head and trying to remember his own name. Well, our only herbalist is busy organising his thoughts, so why don't you tell me what you told him? Yazella says to me. I merely showed him my arms and the effect of your rusty irons on them. As for a cure, all we need is some honey to spread over the wounds. We should go and find some. The walk will help clear Arthmael's head as well, Eosia says. Who's doing that? Katel points to the north, over Canton Lejanx Kuros, where, against the cloudy sky, a carrion crow is commanding the attention of everyone within a league. The constant diving and aerial acrobatics are not natural for that species, or any other, for that matter. I've never seen a crow do that before, Sifra says. Is he so dense to not realise that it's a druid who has taken on that creature's shape? Yeah, let's not lose focus on the honey. We'll know soon enough who is out to embarrass themselves in front of all the influential druids of Britanni, Eosia says. Grami, Give me a hand getting Arthmael up and steadied 